Hi, everybody. Welcome to our um, second or third, I can't remember, um, Zoom lecture for the High Acuity course. And today I'm going to be talking to you about shock. It's really important to keep in mind that often when we're thinking about shock, we think of that general presentation of a patient with a falling blood pressure, a tachycardia, maybe diaphoretic, cool, clammy skin, um, alterations in level of consciousness. All of those are symptoms of the underlying problem. And today we're going to talk about what are the underlying problems and how that leads us to respond differently. But most fundamentally, it's really important to keep in mind that shock results from an inability of our circulatory system to supply adequate oxygen. So it all comes down to, are we able to supply adequate oxygen and secondarily nutrients to our tissues? And there's three reasons why our body's not able to supply that adequate oxygenation and nutrition to our um, to target organs. One is that our, our heart, as our, uh, that cardiac pump, is not able to effectively um, uh, provide enough action, uh, enough of a, that force to be able to circulate what available um, blood we have. Secondly, that we may just have a, a circulatory system that for whatever reason, and we're going to talk about that, has become ineffective. So our heart is able to pump, but the circulatory system is affected. And third, we have that inadequate blood volume. So for some reason, our blood volume has decreased and typically that happens in trauma or some kind of hemorrhagic uh, process. So again, those three things. First, start with the heart. The heart is just not able to pump. We're not able to pump that oxygen and nutrition around. Secondly, we're, the heart is able to pump, but the circulatory system has been affected in such a way that there's a collapse of the circulatory system. So the heart is trying to pump the blood around, but that it, when it moves into those blood vessels, there is a collapse of those blood vessels and we're not able to pump the blood around. Thirdly, that actual blood volume is inadequate. So the heart is pumping, the circulatory system is effective, but the blood volume is inadequate. And in all three of those situations, the end result is we don't get enough oxygen and we don't get enough nutrition to our target organs and to the tissues. So talk about the underlying mechanisms for a minute. This is really important to understand. If we jump immediately to how do we respond, even how do we recognize, we fail to understand why we're doing what we're doing. So in the face of um, cells being deprived of oxygen and nutrition, we start producing ATP. And remember, ATP is that fundamental, um, or that primary building block, that energy mechanism uh, that is necessary for survival, for all cells to survive. So we start producing that ATP anaerobically. And when we produce that ATP anaerobically, our cells begin to swell. We have an increase in that permeability of our cells. And there's that shift in fluid and electrolytes from within the cell and outside of the cell. Why does that matter? That's where we come back to pathophysiology and anatomy. Uh, why does all that matter when we're trying to look after patients in the moment? Because what's happening at the cellular level affects the larger organism. So as we have that change in the permeability of the cells, remember they're not getting enough oxygen. When they're not getting enough oxygen, that ATP is produced anaerobically in, uh, and, as, and that causes the cells to uh, swell. It causes a change in that uh, membrane permeability. That change and causes uh, both electrolyte and fluid shifts. And you know what happens? Our sodium potassium pump, our fundamental pump, it requires energy to function, uh, it fails. The sodium potassium pump, in the absence of enough ATP, fails. The sodium potassium pump is essential for all transmission of nerve impulses. Those nerve impulses affect every single part of our body. So the ability of our brain to function, the ability of us, of, of our body to have any kind of movement uh, at a very deep level, the ability of our heart to continue beating, it all relates to that sodium potassium pump. So no oxygen, changes to the cell membranes, and fluid and electrolyte shifts leads to the failure of that sodium potassium pump and a catastrophic outcome. So let's talk about three broad categorizations of shock. First of all, we have hypovolemic shock, and that's the one that we often all think about. And in hypovolemic shock, what we have is a reduction in the circulating volume. And so we often call that the empty tank. Think of it as a, a car and you've got your fuel tank, there's no fuel. We also have cardiogenic shock. And cardiogenic shock is a problem with the engine. Think back to your car, the engine's not working. So it's not that we don't have enough gas in the tank, but even with a full tank, if the engine won't turn on, if the engine won't properly work, we can't go anywhere, the car won't work. 
And so it's often caused by heart failure of any kind, and it also leads to a, uh, an exacerbation of heart failure. Distributive shock is actually a categorization of uh, three different kinds, three different underlying mechanisms of shock. Uh, and in this case, you'll see this picture is a little bit hard to see, but it's kind of a big bag with a teeny little cat inside. And that idea that the vessels, so remember we talked about the circulating blood, the heart that's pumping, and the third category where our circulatory system fails. In this case, the, circulat the, the vessels are so big that what's inside them seems so very tiny. And, the, and in distributive shock, our vessels become very big, and I'll talk about the mechanisms for that. And there are three kinds of underlying uh, mechanisms that cause this. Neurogenic shock, anaphylactic shock, most of you have heard about that, and septic shock. And for us, for those of us who work in hospitals, that's a very big one that we see as well. And we're going to talk about the stages of shock. So there's three fundamental stages of shock. <coughs> Excuse me, for nurses, it's really important. <coughs> that we're on the lookout because where we can most intervene is in that very first stage. Remember we talked about the beauty of the human body. The human body wants to respond early. It's got those homeostatic mechanisms that are compensatory. They keep our body functioning as long as possible. So we have that first phase, phase where our body is in compensation. All of our mechanisms to compensate for whatever the underlying problem is have been called into action. The second stage of shock, we have much less likelihood of being able to reverse it, and in some cases we may have, may have no likelihood, but the second stage of shock is progressive shock. And in progressive shock, what we see are the very classic symptoms of shock. And finally, the third stage of shock is irreversible, which means that really there's nothing that we can do about it, that there is imminent death. And that is really quite catastrophic uh, when a patient um, presents that way, it's worse when we look back and realize that there were signs and symptoms that we haven't, um, we had, we may not have responded to. And we talked about that in class, the Sancha Bulgin case where a young nurse was not able to see those early signs. Leslie shared a story uh, in her career where a young nurse was not able to see those early signs that would have enabled um, active treatment much earlier. So let's talk about compen the compensatory stage of shock. There are different mechanisms uh, that work for each of those stages. So they're specific to each type of shock. Remember, we talked three kinds of shock, uh, cardiogenic shock, hypovolemic shock, and distributive shock. Different kinds of compensatory mechanisms support uh, the human body in, the, in, that, uh, in each of those different kinds of shock. The priority is to understand what is the underlying disorder and treat it. So a patient may look the same in, a, in two different kinds of shock, but the underlying mechanism is entirely different. And it's really critical that we treat the underlying mechanism. And recognize that all of these rely on homeostasis, the desire of the body to maintain itself and to compensate in such a way that there is a balance between um, how our body is functioning and what we're seeing in terms of uh, presentation of symptoms. So let's start with uh, one of the juicy ones here, hypovolemic shock. Uh, hypovolemic shock, shock is caused by a loss of uh, fluid or uh, most often uh, uh, blood from the body. It can be caused also when we haven't actually lost fluid, but we've third spaced it. And we talked about that uh, a little bit before when we had the, in class, when we had the story of a patient who was um, experiencing very severe ascites, and you have that massive third spacing of fluid into the abdomen. That usually happens over a slow period of time, but when there are dramatic fluid shifts, into that abdomen, for example, we talked about a tap that was happening, a paracentesis that happened too quickly, and you start that, that um, progression of um, shift of fluid into that um, peritoneal, uh, peritoneal cavity, you can have that exacerbation where you have a very significant third spacing of fluid. You haven't lost the fluid out of the body, but you have third spaced it, so it's not accessible to you. You can't use it. Um, uh, hypovolemic shock uh, requires that the body compensate through various homeostatic mechanisms and that compensation is part of a self-preservation process. And so those survival mechanisms rely on a couple of things. One is vasoconstriction. So the blood vessels constrict down very tightly and they become much narrower. Your, your um, arteries, your veins become much narrower and tighter. And our body um, goes through a cascade of uh, chemical responses in order that we retain fluid. And all of, and both that vasoconstriction and retaining any excess fluid should help us to maintain our blood pressure until wherever we have that leak can be identified and rectified. 
left. So if we're bleeding out, we can put pressure on it. Somebody has a stab wound, we can put pressure on it until we can get them to the OR or somewhere else. If somebody is bleeding internally, let's say you have a internal hemorrhage, uh, if we can, if there is some uh, vasoconstriction and that fluid retention, and we would be able to hopefully take that person back uh, to the operating room or somewhere, uh, typically to the operating room, so that we could uh, determine where they're bleeding internally and rectify that situation. So let's talk about these compensatory mechanisms. We're going to start at the top of this picture where we see decreased intravascular volume. So remember, this is hypovolemic shock, decreased intravascular volume. Uh, when we have that decrease in volume, what we see is a, a fall in our cardiac output. So the ability, our heart is still pumping, but there's a decrease in the output because we have less fluid to actually pump out, less uh, circulating blood volume. So as there is a fall in cardiac output, you'll see two uh, um, streams of actions that our body takes um, simultaneously. On the left-hand side, there is a shift in the interstitial fluid. And so our body has fluid in, in a variety of places. There is fluid within the cell and there's a circulating fluid outside of the cell. There is a shift in that fluid to make as much volume uh, available to us for use as possible. So our body naturally shifts that and makes use of any available fluid that we have within our body. Secondly, there is a release of these important hormones, aldosterone and antidiuretic hormones. Both of those hormones are going to enable us to hold on to as much fluid as possible. So we're going to see a decrease in urinary output. We're going to see a decrease in sweating and other things as a natural compensatory process. So you know how we typically say if a fall in, in uh, urine output is a, a, is a sign that things are not well and that the patient may be hypovolemic or other things. This is a part of a mechanism that our body is using to hold on to fluid. So we want to hold on to that urine and we want to make less urine and keep that fluid volume circulating as opposed to use it to um, get rid of waste. We also have a third source of um, uh, fluid volume in our spleen. And do you remember we talked about that the other day? The, the, the spleen is very effective in sort of being a reservoir for excess blood and the spleen will disengorge or actually have that, that sort of reservoir of excess blood will be um, uh, released from the spleen and used by the rest of the body. Those three things happening, that shift in the interstitial fluid, the release of those hormones, aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone, and the disengorgement of the spleen all lead to an increase in your circulating blood volume. So already your body has responded. We have compensation to increase our blood volume. And in increasing our blood volume, we at least temporarily increase our cardiac output, right? So decrease cardiac output by a, a decreased amount of blood volume. These three things happen on that left-hand side, and they lead to increase, temporary increase in blood volume, and that increases cardiac output temporarily. At the same time, our body kicks into gear and releases some more hormones, adrenaline and noradrenaline. These chemicals are really important because they, um, they rev up our system, and they um, increase the tone of our... Um, um, uh, venous system and our arterial system, our vascular system, um, so that our heart is beating, pumping as effectively as it can and our uh, vascular system has good tone so that as our heart is beating, we're able to um, circulate whatever blood volume we have most effectively. That, so, so ultimately, we're increasing our heart rate and our systemic vascular resistance through that. And doing that also increases our cardiac output. So in two ways, we're increasing cardiac output. In one way, it's by temporarily increasing blood volume by using whatever reserves we have and holding on to whatever water or fluid we have. And on the other side, we're increasing our heart rate and our um, systemic vascular resistance, so the tone in our vasculature, so that on both sides, that leads to a temporary increase in cardiac output. Do you remember, this is compensatory. It's happening for a short period of time. We do not rely on this for anything except to buy us a little bit of time. So what are those signs of hypovolemic shock? Uh, most people, it's remarkable to, uh, to appreciate this, that most people can maintain a reasonable blood pressure with up to 1,500 mil loss of uh, circulating volume. So if you think about that, a liter and a half loss of circulating volume, most people still have a reasonable blood pressure. So blood pressure is a late sign, and we always have to be careful about it. Instead, for early signs, we're looking at uh, things like uh, color their temperature to touch, their heart rate, and their generalized state, their level of consciousness, their um, um, uh, alertness, uh, restlessness, things like that. It's important to recognize that in various um, 
different various conditions, how much blood can be can be lost quite uh, quickly. So, for example, a long bone fracture like a, a femur, a fractured femur, you hit by a car and someone has a fractured femur, you can lose a thousand mils of um, circulating volume within your leg. So you're not bleeding out. You're, you're typically bleeding uh, within. Um, within your thigh, but a thousand mils can easily be lost very quickly. Uh, fractured pelvis, 300 mils, uh, ruptured spleen. Remember we talked about that spleen as a beautiful reservoir that's gonna help us when we need circulating blood volume. A ruptured spleen, and think of a young um, athlete on football field who may um, be involved in some kind of um, al physical altercation or uh, tackled, something like that. 2000 mils of blood can be lost very, very quickly. And and often we don't see that immediately because those are all blood loss with internally. So um, we often don't see these so the um, uh, signs of hypovolemic shock uh, in a very clear way until a patient has lost up to 15% or approximately of their circulating blood volume or approximately 50, uh, 750 mils. So we have to lose at least 750 mils before we start to even see any of these signs. That's why it's important to always be assessing our patients, always be on top of um, how a patient is presenting um, and what, what changes we're seeing in a very subtle way. And really important to recognize that increase in respiratory rate, increase in heart rate, uh, beginning changes in level of consciousness, those are all signs that precede that classic drop in blood pressure, which is a late sign in hypovolemic shock. Um, so we want to look at color, we want to look at temp, we want to look at uh, someone's peripheries, are they cold? Um, and we want to understand how, uh, if, how the, the process of fluid loss um, allows compensatory mechanisms to kick in. But if we fail to respond early, those compensatory mechanisms will not con uh, continue. A point I want to make here about um, increased respiratory rate is that you remember we talked about shock being a fundamental process where we have a decrease in the ability of the body to um, adequately transport oxygen to our target organs and our tissues. As we increase our respiratory rate, part of that, or fundamental to that, is this idea that we build up what's called lactic acid. And lactic acid happens for, from anaerobic uh, cellular processes. Um, and it causes, so this buildup of lactic acid causes respiratory alkalosis. Today we're going to talk about APGs and we'll talk about that a little bit more. That respiratory alkalosis um, is something that our body responds to by increasing our respiratory rate. The respiratory alkalosis also leads to altered mental state. And that's why we're, we see that early confusion or restlessness or um, uh, that feeling that something's wrong, often that. So watching for early signs means really important attention to respiratory rate, which, which often in clinical uh, can be overlooked, uh, and understanding that it's part of that lactic, acido, uh, lactic acidosis, respiratory alkalosis um, process that needs to be um, responded to. And that's why in the case of shock, we're always paying attention to the level of oxygenation. So treatment, not a surprise. Number one, oxygenation. We wanna optimize our ventilation and our oxygenation um, we don't want to use positive pressure ventilation because that decreases our cardiac output. So oxygenation would be um, high flow oxygen and we are, uh, if somebody has an uh, O2 sat of 92 or 93, in the case of hypovolemic shock, it is inadequate. We're putting on high flow oxygen to get to hyperoxygenate as much as possible and again, not positive pressure ventilation. Even if we're intubating a patient, and we'll talk a little bit about this later in the term, we have to watch for that positive pressure um, because that will decrease our, our um, cardiac output and that's a fundamental um, mechanism that we need to support through this process of uh, treatment for shock. We also want to optimize our intravascular volume and we're going to do that by inserting two large bore IVs. Uh, we talked last week about antecubital being a terrible site um, for IV start. In the case of shock, we're going to try to put a large bore IV, probably an antecubital on each side. Um, an 18 gauge is good, a 16 gauge is better if it's possible. Um, we're going to go for a central line if it's possible um, because we know we're going to have to be um, providing the patient with a large amount of fluid. We're going to need to take uh, blood tests. We're going to need to do, we're going to need um, high quality access because we may have to do, uh, a, a provide a blood transfusion and other things. Um, we are going to make sure vital signs are stable. We're going to monitor the patient. We're going to take 
blood and have sent that to the lab. The kinds of blood tests we're going to be looking at would be a CBC to look at the patient's current hemoglobin. We need to see how uh, what their platelets are at in case we were having to transfuse extensively. We're going to look at their INR to see what their blood clotting is like. We are going to look at their um, electrolytes because that's really key when we're looking at these fluid and electrolyte shifts. We're going to make sure that we do a crossing type, and that means that we the blood bank is beginning to to um, get ready for the possibility that we may have to transfuse this patient with um, blood. Um, typically, what we're talking about when we are optimizing the intravascular volume is um, beginning with crystalloid infusion. Now. Um, Crystalloid, remember we talked a little bit about this, crystalloids and colloids. Crystalloids are those IV solutions like um, normal saline, two-thirds and a third, Ringer's lactate, D5W. Uh, colloids would, were those solutions that were like uh, uh, blood, plasma, um, albumin. We're going to start typically with crystalloids. Um, and crystalloid is, in this situation, we need a hydrating solution. Do you remember we talked about hydrating solutions? Um, when we're optimizing intravascular volume, we want to use normal saline typically, or Ringer's lactate, typically. We're going to bolus, which means we're going to um, trans or we're going to infuse fluid as quickly as we can. Um, there's, uh, we may transfuse blood. Hopefully, we have an opportunity to be able to give cross-match blood, which means that the patient's blood sample has gone to the lab. The lab has, has given us a feedback on exactly what kind of blood the patient can get, and that's the kind of blood we're able to give. Do you remember what we give if we can't get cross-match blood? We're going to give O blood uh, because that's the universal donor. And O negative is the most ideal, which means it's Rh negative. The patient that it's most important that we give O negative as opposed to just O positive or just O is that uh, is a patient who would be a female of childbearing age so that she doesn't have later complications associated with that. There is some emerging evidence around the use of 3% hypertonic saline solution um, and it the evidence would suggest that um, it can restore mean ulterior uh, uh, arterial pressure quite quickly and that um, it, it particularly if a patient is in, is markedly hypotensive we may uh, be infusing that you're going to see that only in a trauma you're not going to see that on a, a surgical floor. You're not going to. See, you're, you're typically going to see that in a trauma unit. You may see it in the OR under certain circumstances, but ideally, you're going to see that in a trauma unit. There's there is some data around using even a higher volume, higher um, concentration of saline. This is very specific. There's very specific protocols associated with it. It's quite a dangerous um, use of uh, IV fluids. Uh, it's very effective because what you're doing is not uh, providing the person with so much. Um, uh, volume that that may cause problems and you may, may end up with a cascade where you third space some of that volume that's not necessarily helpful. The data would say it's there is equivalent um, outcomes, patient outcomes, in using that 3% hypertonic saline solution versus uh, larger amounts of um, crystalloids, but it is a very specific process. So for most of you, for most of your careers, what you're going to see is um, that you will be uh, transfusing probably in a situation like this normal saline or uh, uh, lactated ringers. Um, if the patient is markedly hypotensive in later stages of shock, you may be giving crystalloids and blood immediately at the same time. Um, what we talked about in class is that we no longer position the patient in Trendelenburg head down. But sometimes some body positioning is helpful, moving the legs up and watching that we're not um, causing uh, uh, blood restriction there. There's some evidence that it may or may not be helpful. Uh, but at this point, it, it is certainly not harmful the way we now suggest Trendelenburg is. If a patient is pregnant, there may be a need to roll them onto their side to, to make sure that the, the uh, baby is moved off their inferior vena cava. So we typically roll them onto their left side. We're going to watch for um, fluid overload as we're uh, providing this uh, large rapid infusion of fluids to optimize that intravascular volume. Um, and, and we're going to consider whether we have to provide the patient with any, any additional colloids such as those, um, as such as that um, hydroxyethyl starches, and that's those volume expanders that we were talking about in class. Um, we want to locate and correct the underlying cause. Uh, it's really critical that we, we determine if a patient is bleeding out or if a patient is bleeding internally with a severe hypoglycemia.
a chalk or if there's this massive third spacing of volume. And we want to consider if we need to um, uh, optimize cardiac output with medications. And so it's really important to, to be prepared, in particular with patients who may be elderly or with pre-existing heart disease or other things, that there may be a combination of fluid resuscitation as well as the use of cardiac medications to optimize their cardiac output. We're going to watch for hypothermia. We're going to watch for, uh, particularly with, with rapid infusion of fluids, and we may end up warming fluids or doing other kinds of things to manage that. Uh, we're going to make sure, again, that um, they are, a uh, patient is, is well oxygenated, um, and we're going to be assessing them constantly. So let's talk about cardiogenic shock for a moment. So cardiogenic shock uh, results from failure of the heart. So remember we talked about it's the engine that no matter how much our, um, gas we've got in the tank, it just won't work. Um, it's considered an engine malfunction. And cardiogenic shock, tragically, even if we recognize it early and treat it very early, has an 80% mortality. Um, statistics have gone up and down on that, but, but we're still running an extremely high mortality. The problem with cardiogenic shock is that the normal compensatory mechanisms that, that we talked about earlier um, uh, that are that kick in with our body lead to ultimate heart damage. So in cardiogenic shock, if you think about it as your um, heart is not as failing and you're having decreased cardiac output and your uh, body is then um, increasing the tone of those blood vessels and your heart rate is increasing, you're actually increasing demand on the very organ that is injured and not functioning. So increasing demand on the heart, decreasing further the oxygenation of that heart, and it becomes this um, uh, circular uh, process where the heart is damaged and it is further damaging itself in trying to respond to what's happening within the body. Um, let's see. The process of cardiogenic shock and uh, is really important to understand. And so here, here, here's exactly what happens. We have a decrease in that cardiac output. And as we have a decrease in the cardiac output, remember we talked about the sympathetic ner nervous system, which is essential for maintaining your blood pressure, and that triggers the compensatory mechanisms. And um, those compensatory mechanisms where we have a maintaining of fluid and increasing of heart rate, increase the workload and the oxygen demand of the heart, and the heart is already struggling to get enough oxygen and nutrition. So counterproductive by increasing that cardiac workload, and we ultimately end up with failure of the heart as a pump uh, and shock and impaired cellular metabolism signs of cardiac shock. It's interesting to see. Very first, we're not talking about blood pressure dropping. We're talking about behavioral signs. Early signs of cardiogenic shock are restlessness and confusion. We then see physiological signs, which may be that increasing heart rate, uh, decreasing um, pulse pressure, decreasing urinary output, and weakness. It's really critical, even though we have a very low survival rate with cardiogenic shock, that the earlier we recognize those symptoms, the more we can support the patient, in particular, in this case, with cardiac drugs. Late signs of cardiogenic shock, again, we're going to see behavioral signs, which are this really marked decrease in level of consciousness, and physiological signs that are cold and clammy skin. The patient's going to become cyanotic. We're going to see that dyspnea here because a patient will quickly develop pulmonary edema. So the heart is not able to effectively pump that uh, um, circulating volume around. We've held on to as much fluid as possible, and our body then tries to third space that fluid out of the way. It's third spacing it right into the lungs. Patients often can develop, again, that nausea and vomiting. Very typical that they would develop chest pain because you've got, again, that struggling heart that's not getting enough oxygen. We're forcing it to work harder. It gets even less time to be oxygenated in that, in that gap between um, our heart contracting and that filling time. And we often, in this case, it's quite interesting, we'll see an increase in blood sugar from the release of those um, glycogen stores as our body really uh, does everything it can to try to resolve this underlying Uh, so how are we going to treat um, cardiogenic shock? It's so important. We're coming back. Do you remember we're coming back to oxygen? Isn't this interesting? In shock, people always think I need to transfuse blood and I need to give fluid. First and foremost, we're always thinking oxygenation. So again, good high flow oxygen, not positive pressure if, even if a patient is uh, uh, on a ventilator. Constant, consistent nursing assessments that document even the most minute changes in a patient's condition. We're going to look at other cardiac considerations. Are they on cardiac meds? Do, they, do we know anything about their cardiac status? 
uh, we need to look at hemodynamic intervention. So what can we do to support the patient uh, in terms of their, uh, under, if they have any other underlying um, dysrhythmias or other things, we need um, lab results. So we need to understand uh, their electrolytes. We need to see if they are in, uh, continuing to infarct, reinfarcting. Um, so we're going to look at uh, their troponin levels. We're also going to look at um, sodium and potassium. We remember that sodium potassium pump. Other sets of lab values. We need ABGs on a person like this and immediate transfer to in ICU care. If the patient is to have any likelihood of survival, a patient in cardiogenic shock needs to be transferred immediately to one-on-one -on -one high level nursing care in, uh, in an ICU setting. Okay, distributive shock. It's interesting. Uh, distributive shock is the third category. And if you remember from that picture at the very beginning of this slideshow, there was that big paper bag with a tiny little cat in it. So this is where the vessel becomes too large. So now I'm going to remind us all again, those three kinds of shock. We've got shock where we've got no engine, no gas in the tank. And that's that hypovolemic, no gas in our car. Two, we've got a car where, or where the, there's gas in the tank, but the engine won't work. And that is our cardiogenic shock. And three, now we've got distributive shock. And distributive shock means the engine will work, the heart's gonna work. I've got gas in the tank, but I can't distribute it. I can't get it around to where it needs to go. And in that case, the car also stops working. There are three underlying mechanisms that, we, that are categorized under distributive shock. That's neurogenic shock. If you can imagine that's related to our nervous system. <coughs> There's anaphylactic shock. We know that that's uh, when we come in contact with a, uh, an allergen. And there's septic shock. And when we work in hospital settings, we see that a lot. And remember, the analogy here is that the tank is too large. So we'll talk about these quickly. Neurogenic shock is caused, uh, it's a typical an imbalance between the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system sort of revs up our, our uh, body. It uh, increases the tone. Do you remember we talked about that before? It increases the tone of our blood vessels. The parasympathetic system relaxes it brings us down. And, and the parasympathetic system um, causes a uh, relaxing of the tone of those of the, our vasculature, all those blood vessels. And so when we have um, things like uh, trauma, uh, particular trauma to our brain, uh, in particular to the medulla, a response to some kinds of anesthetics, um, a, a head injury, we are at risk for this neurogenic shock. Um, it's really important that hypoglycemia on rare occasions, very severe hypoglycemia, can interrupt our sympathetic nervous system activity as well. Some kinds of depressive drugs, we need to be careful about that. Um, and extreme acute pain can lead to neurogenic shock. So it's really important we're watching our systemic vascular resistance, uh, and it's now inadequate to drive the nutrients across the capillary, capillary bed. So what's the process in neurogenic shock? That imbalance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic stimulation. So our blood vessels all dilate. They all just become loose and big. So imagine I've got enough blood, but when my blood vessels just become so loose, they dilate so much that blood, I'm not able to pump that blood around. It has nowhere to go. It just fills the vessel and sits there. We, as a result, we end up with a decrease in cardiac output because the heart is pumping, but there's the, it takes too much force to try to get that blood to move around. And there is not enough volume, not because we've lost volume, but because of that massive vasodilation to move that blood, to transport that blood. It results in hypotension and a decrease in the perfusion of oxygen and nutrients at the cellular level. What we see, as opposed to other situations, is that we'll actually have warm and dry skin and sometimes a little bit of pinkish skin. And that's, imagine you've got this big, uh, these big vessels and that massive dilation and all that blood flowing to uh, the periphery. We also see a bradycardia and patients will lose consciousness. So they'll, they'll faint, which can be actually an adaptive response, trying to get your body to the ground. And um, interestingly, in this process of neurogenic shock, we see those intracerebral changes, changes at the level of our brain. And this is where we see cerebral edema. So actual swelling in the cerebrum as we have this um, sluggishness of perfusion of um, blood and that lack of oxygen to our uh, cerebrum leads to that um, cerebral edema. So what do we need to do for our patients? Uh, careful neuro observations, and we talked last week in class about Glasgow Coma Scale. We're gonna be doing this constantly. We're gonna be monitoring their temp monitoring temperature because we've got that vasodilation. 
we're going to be watching for DBT. We've got blood pooling everywhere. So we can have large DBTs. We can also have micro clotting happening. And we're going to be watching for signs of increased intracranial pressure and often increased intracranial pressure. We see that uh, uh, changes in pulse pressure. If the patient is a surgical patient and if anesthetic is involved in this situation, what we need to do is reverse that anesthetic immediately. And again, we're always thinking, how do I treat the underlying cause? Anaphylactic shock is something we typically would see in the ER, but sometimes you'll see an anaphylactic shock in any kind of unit where a patient is receiving a particular antibiotics. <coughs> Anaphylaxis is a systemic allergic reaction to uh, an allergen, to an antigen. And commonly we see this with shellfish, with peanuts, with penicillin, um, and with insect bites. It occurs on the second exposure. Remember, the first exposure is the one that primes you or trick, it gets you ready. The second exposure is the one in which you, you have this full board response. Typically, not always, sometimes you see on first exposure a much more severe reaction. The allergen, uh, uh, when, it, when our body comes in contact with the allergen, we uh, respond in this sort of uh, chemical cascade, again, this defensive reaction, but the defensive reaction is not, it, it is not adequate. What we see happening through the process is um, the peripheral edema or pooling of fluid. Remember, this, this is a category of distributive shock. The vasculature becomes big. So uh, peripherally, we see edema of uh, so swelling in our peripheries and that pooling of blood, particularly in our uh, lower limbs. This, we, have, we see smooth muscle constriction. Respiratory and cardiovascular collapse can happen within minutes. So you can stop. You have a tachycardia followed by a, a very rapid um, uh, tachypnea, or so rapid respiratory rate, followed by respiratory and cardiovascular collapse. We can also see um, symptoms that we're going to watch for earlier. So anxiety, skin rash, and GI cramps. Our body is quite effective at trying to get rid of whatever we have been exposed to. Particularly if we've eaten it, our body wants to throw it up or GI cramping to have immediate time. Nursing considerations in anaphylactic shock. Uh, we're going to be watching our patient. Watching for decreased blood pressure, increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate, increased temperature. The, it's in, essential that we withdraw the uh, whatever is uh, causing the allergic reaction immediately. So withdraw that antigen immediately. Remember, if this is a drug that we're infusing, we're going to take it down immediately. We're going to um, actually disconnect the line so that we don't give the patient what, whatever drug may be in that line. We're taking the entire line off and putting a new fresh line there. Uh, we're getting help immediately. We're going to shock is an underlying problem of lack of oxygenation at the cellular level so we're going to optimize ventilation and oxygenation in this case we maintaining airway is going to be critical and it may be that we have to intubate or do even more if, the, if there is that narrowing of airway uh, and looking at whether we're going to have to do um, some kind of um, more advanced um, tracheotomy or something uh, drug therapy is going to be fairly straightforward and we're going to keep these in mind. There, there may be other things that we're going to talk about at some point, but here we want to keep these three levels important. Benadryl, we're going to give that as a, a, like an IV antihistamine and Benadryl can be effective. We're going to give epinephrine and we're going to give IV steroids like Soyaporta. Uh, sometimes there are other, there's some other medications as part of that process, but those three things are really critical as a starting point to keep in mind. Finally, septic shock. Most common type of distributive shock. Remember, distributive vessels become so in septic shock, we've got a bacteremia, and that leads to this chemical cascade and inflammatory response. And the most at risk, we know this, the elderly, the very young, so a neonate, people who have an uh, immunocompromised system or immunosuppressed system, and those who have underlying illnesses. Most often we see this with gram-negative bacteria. And you know what, I, I've talked about this in class, HOTI, hospital-acquired UTI, invasive catheters are one of the most common causes of sepsis uh, in abdominal surgery because we got that gram-negative bacteria from our colon, abdominal surgery, a huge risk for septic shock. Initially in septic shock, we're going to see fever, although it's important to recognize in the elderly patient, we may not see uh, fever to the degree that we would see in a younger person. We see vasodilation. Remember, those blood vessels are losing tone. They're all um, expanding. So as they lose tone, we see that flushing of skin and that we see it at initially that increase in cardiac output as the heart is trying to respond and is uh, trying to pump against uh, against what a decreasing ball, a decreasing resistance, and so we see that edema. Remember that third spacing of fluid into our periphery. Later on in septic shock, we're going to see um, blood pressure and urinary urinary output fall, and as a result, we see that tachycardia. 
finally, as cells res resort to that anaerobic metabolism, remember we talked about this, we try to uh, blow off that uh, lactic acid by increasing our respiratory rate. So what are the nursing considerations? We're going to locate the causative organism. What is causing this um, uh, situation? And we're going to treat with, under, uh, with antibiotics. We need to support the person's cardiovascular system. We need to administer IV fluid uh, and, and high flow oxygen as we go along. We may or may not have to give inotropes. Inotropes are a category of drug that's going to increase that um, uh, vascular tone. It's important to keep in mind that if it's not co uh, corrected, this could lead to late septic shock, which has a very huge mortality rate. Um, and when we see late septic shock, that's where we're seeing that cardiac output, which initially has uh, uh, increased as a compensatory mechanism fails. The blood pressure falls. We see uh, no urine output, uh, tachycardia. The patient's cold and clammy. Uh, that respiratory rate, which initially was rapid, decreases, and we see a, a loss of consciousness. So in uh, the compensatory stage, it's really important to recognize that BP can be normal. The place we don't often see this is that it, in early septic shock, we often in early septic shock will, will start to see a change in blood pressure almost immediately. But otherwise, in compensatory stage in general, blood pressure can be normal. We often will see an increase in heart rate and an increase in respiratory rate. Remember, the respiratory rate is all related to that moving to anaerobic respiration at the cellular level, trying to blow off that lactic acid. Um, uh, we have cold peripheries. The patient becomes clammy. Uh, we have decrease in urinary output. But it's not necessarily in the compensatory stage less than 30 mils. So this is where we watch the pattern of decreasing urinary output. We see diminished bowel sounds. The patient is anxious and restless. So those behavioral signs typically precede physiological signs. And if respiratory alkalosis develops, we're going to see that confusion and aggression. Now, progressive stage is the next stage of shock. So we go from compensatory stage, and we're always trying to recognize shock at the compensatory stage. We're trying to leverage our help on the mechanisms that the body has put in place to try to save itself. In the progressive stage, which is the next stage, we see um, an inadequate perfusion of the central organs and the organs begin to fail. Uh, we see a systolic blood pressure typically less than 75 with a heart rate typically higher than 150. And that's where you see that classic weak, rapid, ready pulse. Capillary permeability is affected. So those the um, uh, membranes, the capillary membranes are affected and we have that leakage of electrolytes across the capillary membranes. Um, recovery is unlikely, just we're not even at the, the terminal stage yet, but at the second stage, once we've moved from compensatory stage shock, recovery is unlikely even with treatment, but we are highly aggressive still. At this stage, we're going to see a decrease in level of consciousness and we may see already dilated pupils. So at the level of, the, um, of your brain, we're seeing a decrease in responsiveness. We see oliguria, which is actually less than 20 mils an hour, and we may even move to anuria, so no urine output. Uh, we see, uh, again, continuing changes in fluid and electrolyte balances, as well as, importantly, acid-base balance. And again, we're going to talk about um, ABG analysis in class. We may see that heart failure as uh, our body tries to third space fluid that it's not able to uh, pump around, as vasculature um, uh, is not able to maintain adequate tone. So heart failure, so we're going to secure crackles in someone's lungs. Um, the heart becomes an inefficient pump. We're going to see uh, also dysrhythmias as, remember, that um, sodium potassium uh, pump is affected. Our nerve transmission is affected. Um, and we see that excitability of the heart in ways that lead to dysrhythmias, which may be uh, lethal. We see renal failure. The liver begins to fail, and the liver is involved, most importantly, in, uh, in things like uh, glucose, uh, severe um, glucose um, response, so that where we can get our glycogen stores, but also in blood clotting. We also begin to see respiratory failure, and ultimately because of that liver involvement, we may see TIC, which is disseminated intravascular coagulation. Microclots begin to form everywhere. Our body is not able to break those down. Um, we can uh, Those microclots can cause uh, larger DVTs. They can also cause um, clots to the levels of our target organs, and so our, our organs continue to have um, to be assaulted. And finally, we get to irreversible stage. In irreversible stage shock, if it's untreated, the patient inevitably, um, every case of shock if untreated will inevitably progress to this irreversible stage. Um, and in this stage, what we see is cardiac, hepatic, renal, respiratory, pancreatic, GI, hematological, and neurological failure. 
all of our major organs fail and often we talk about that more consistent failure. This organ damage is not reversible. There's nothing we can do to reverse it. It doesn't respond to treatment and ultimately what we see is death. A patient may move very quickly through compensatory, progressive, and irreversible stage shock, or we may see a delayed response between them. Often we are not able to pick up on shock until we are in late compensatory shock, moving to progressive, but that's not always the case. And what we know from data is that good nursing care, good nursing observation, 24 hours a day, eyes on a patient, uh, looking at what we've talked about in class in those patterns of pre pattern of presentation of vital signs, level of awareness, and um, other key indicators that can be very subtle from moment to moment will make a difference in recognizing the signs and symptoms of an, of an impending crisis and or picking up a mask after that crisis has happened and we may not be able to help our patients. Thanks for listening. This has been a fantastic uh, opportunity for me to talk a little bit about shock and I hope we have a great time together working through uh, a shock scenario. See you in class.